Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm Vidya from Fresh Team, the data software service uh, from Freshworks. Freshworks, as uh, you may know, uh, is a software as a service unicorn, which has around 250,000 customers using its suite of products. Uh, at Fresh Team, we are curating uh, a number of interviews uh, of thought leaders uh, in the HR space who in influence and inspire us. Uh, and we also put together stories of uh, people and organizations that have gotten their new strategies right. And uh, today we are delighted and honored uh, to have uh, Dr. Jonathan Westover as our special guest. Uh, he is uh, managing partner and principal at uh, Human Capital Innovations. He is also Associate Professor of Organization Development at Business. And uh, I'll hand it over to you, John. Thank you and welcome uh, to this interview session. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I was really uh, pleased to have the opportunity to connect with you. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to share um, some materials with the Freshworks community. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Sure. Thanks, John. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, I am uh, I work with Human Capital Innovations in terms of my consulting work, um, but I also uh, work in the organizational leadership department in the Woodbury School of Business at Utah Valley University. So uh, my home is in Orem, Utah. Um, for any of you who may be unfamiliar with uh, with Utah, we had the we hosted the uh, 2002. Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. So uh, that's that's one of our uh, bright moments uh, on the global stage. Uh, in addition to my role as department chair and professor in the organizational leadership department, I'm also the academic director in the Center for Social Impact at Utah Valley University. Um, so I wear many hats uh, and all of these hats lead to the same general space and that is um, the opportunity uh, to help organizations be more successful, uh, to be uh, more efficient, and uh, to address the, the difficult challenges and problems that every organization faces uh, each and every day. So my remarks today, uh, I'm going to talk about implementing and measuring employee engagement and satisfaction, generally at first, but also uh, specifically looking at um, the scale-up environment uh, for uh, startup businesses that are scaling, but also for uh, other organizations that may be going through a period of transition and scaling up their business as well. Uh, and we'll be doing some Q&A and asking some questions along the way. Uh, and I welcome any offline follow-up uh, to any of these materials or additional questions you may have. So please feel free to reach out to me at john.westover at gmail.com uh, if uh, you uh, would like any more information. Um, as was mentioned in the brief uh, introduction, um, I've been working in this space for a long time. Uh, for a couple of decades, I've been working to help transform organizations across the globe. Um, and maybe one other aspect to my interdisciplinary approach and how I address things, uh, in addition to what's already been shared, is that I'm also a faculty fellow uh, for ethics and public life in the Center for the Study of Ethics. And so you start to see the, the uh, combination of organizational leadership, HR, OD, um, along with social impact and ethics. In my mind, all of these areas go together and are very important as we're trying to address complex uh, problems within organizations. So what I'm going to cover over the next uh, uh, little bit, I want to start with a general look at why do we need to pay attention to strategic HR? Why is that important in the current world of work? And why would it be important in the future of work? Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about the research on creating a culture of employee engagement and job satisfaction. Some of this related to my own research. Some of it related to other uh, research out there in the field. I want to talk a little bit about measuring employee and organizational engagement. Uh, and then I'm going to share an example of an organization I've worked with as a consultant um, who went through rapid scale up and faced all sorts of organizational challenges. Uh, and uh, I'll try to address specifically some of the things that they 
could have done and should have done in terms of uh, measuring employee engagement and satisfaction and creating that healthy culture. Uh, and then I'll wrap things up looking at the intersection of leadership and service and what I argue is really important in any organization um, in today's world, and that is that we break free of our functional silos and find an opportunity to have a more interdisciplinary approach to how we address our, our, our problems uh, that we face, both as societies but also as organizations. Okay, so let me start with a really quick look at strategic HR. Um, this isn't a surprise to any of you, I'm sure, but we have HR management systems that are the, the policies, practices, and systems that influence employees' behavior, attitudes, and performance. And these are, it's like a Venn diagram. These are intersecting um, components, all of which influence each other. So better behavior influences attitudes, which certainly influences performance, but vice versa. Performance in, uh, uh, influences attitudes, which influences behavior. Behavior influences performance. They're, they're all interconnected, and there's um, linkages all over the place. And so within HR, we're trying to think of how do we systematically structure organizations in such a way through policies, practices, and systems that we can hit all three of those areas to lead to high performance work systems. When a company has effective human resource management, they have greater innovation, greater productivity, and they have a better reputation in the community. And in today's hyper competitive global marketplace, uh, this is really important because consumers do care who they shop from. They vote with their with their wallets and with their checkbooks, and they want to know that they are supporting organizations that have a social mission, that are socially responsible, uh, and that are, are ethical in how they deal with the, the different issues that they face with their employees, with the environment, and with the consumers. And so when we have effective HR systems, we're able to, uh, to generate better brand loyalty, better customer satisfaction and loyalty, uh, and it's, it's a really powerful mechanism. It comes back to this idea of human capital. So when we talk about HR, uh, another way to phrase that is, is human capital. Uh, in, and think about all of the different forms of capital that you have within an organization. We have our, uh, our financial capital, of course. We have intellectual capital. We have property um, equipment. Um, we have all of these different elements that we rely on for the organization to, be, to have a strategic advantage and uh, a competitive advantage. And we invest in those forms of capital, we protect those forms of capital, and we make sure uh, that they will uh, be safe moving into the future. Um, the same should be true for our human capital. So organizations um, have employees, and those employees are the source of their creativity, their innovation, their productivity, and their ultimate success. Those employees bring with them certain knowledge, skills, and abilities that you might be able to measure on a resume or through an interview process to, you know, to, to bring people into the firm. Uh, but there's also a lot of intangibles that are actually really difficult to measure and make up the entirety of the human capital, the human asset, uh, when people come to organizations. It's the, the holistic nature of all the training and experience, judgment, intelligence, relationships, and insight that they bring with them to the table that will help them collaborate with others on complex problems that will help them to address complex issues and ultimately will drive better innovation within the organization. So we want to make sure that we value human capital just like we value other forms of capital and that we treat it as something worthy of our investment uh, so that we can leverage it to the greatest extent possible and get the best bang for our buck. Everyone within an organization who has any sort of leadership role, even all the way down to the line supervisor, performs human resource management functions. Um, so whether or not they have HR in their job title, they do HR if they're leading people. Um, so even a supervisor that's only supervising two or three people on a regular basis, they're gonna be doing all of these things that you see in this diagram. They're gonna be helping to define the nature of the job itself. They're going to be forecasting future labor needs. They're going to be providing training, the front line of training for those people in their team. They're going to be involved in the interview process and the selection process for new people on the team. They're going to be doing performance evaluations and performance management. They're going to have to um, deal with all of that feedback uh, and provide meaningful coaching and feedback to their employees. They will be the ones that are involved in recommending pay increases and promotions. 
They're the front lines of communicating corporate policies. And ultimately, it falls on the supervisor to motivate uh, both in terms of pay but other intrinsic factors and find other ways to uh, meaningful, salient ways uh, that are valued by employees for you know, other benefits and rewards. Uh, and so from the lowest supervisory um, frontline level all the way up through the organization to middle management on through up through executive levels in the C-suite, anyone who's leading other people and managing people is doing HR work. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of people um, who are in those roles are never trained in HR. They are never trained in these functional areas and they don't actually know how to do these things. And this is particularly relevant within the startup space and within organizations that are rapidly scaling is a lot of times you have, uh, you have founders who have a great idea for a product or service, uh, some really great innovative approach to uh, addressing a, some sort of consumer need and generating demand, um, and they, they start a business and they start the product, uh, providing the product or service, and then all of a sudden they see rapid growth and they go from maybe one or two people on their startup team to five people, to 10 people, to 20 people. And then all of a sudden they're, they have 100 employees, 500 employees, 1,000 employees. And their, expert, their area of expertise is in maybe in uh, coding. Maybe it's, you know, they created an app or they, they have some sort of um, uh, specialty in information systems or they have, you know, some sort of technical um, expertise that allowed them to start this business with this really great idea, but they don't have any background in leadership. They don't have any background in management. They don't have any background in how to do all of these things that every person that manages people has to be able to do for an organization to be successful. Um, so that's really partly what we're talking about today is how important it is for every organization from new startups all the way up through mid, you know, mid-sized organizations, scaling up through large organizations, they need to pay special attention to the role of human capital and the role of HR within their organization. When we have high-performance work systems, it leads to higher profits. So there's a ton of research around every single arrow that you see in this diagram. Um, and there's lots of, I could add other boxes and other arrows. So basically, there's tons of research that shows when you have high performance work systems um, that come out of a strong HR, human capital and employee centric um, culture within an organization, it leads to higher profits. So just a couple of those relationships, you can see the pathways here. Uh, interesting jobs, when you design interesting work for your employees to do, that leads to satisfied workers, that leads to lower absenteeism, lower turnover, lower costs and higher profits. It also leads to more satisfied customers, higher sales and higher profits. But on the other side of the equation, when you have a, a really positive workplace culture where people feel safe, they feel valued, they feel like they can contribute and they want to contribute, uh, and they're not worried to fail, but they're, they're, they're gonna try new things. When you have that kind of an innovative knowledge sharing type of a culture, it drives innovation, it drives creativity, it drives higher quality, which leads to better customer satisfaction, greater productivity, and higher profits. So HR and hum, uh, human capital and employee, uh, uh, an employee eccentric, um, employee centric culture, um, it's, that's just not warm, fuzzy, fluffy type of stuff that we're talking about. That directly also hits the bottom line of the company. It, if you invest in the human capital, just like investing in other forms of capital, you will drive higher profits. Uh, and there's so much research to demonstrate that. So uh, those are some of the types of things that we're gonna continue to explore together today. Another issue that I wanna briefly address is this idea of uh, person organization fit uh, and person job fit is a, a similar construct um, and value congruence. That's another similar construct. So the, it's the basic idea that when you bring people into the organization that that person Com brings with them and all of their um, collective experience and background and, and worldview and perspective, they have values that they bring with them to the table. Uh, they have a driving purpose, you know, answering their why. Why, are they, why do they want to be there? Why do they want to be part of this organization? And when the alignment between the person and their values 
and the organization and its values is really tight and that, that there's a close alignment, we say there's a high person organization fit. When there's that, a close alignment with the specific job that they're performing, we would say there's a high person job fit. Um, when those values align, another term is, is value congruence. Uh, and so basically when there's high person job fit, high person organization fit, and high value congruence within an organization, that leads to higher job performance, um, stronger future job choices, lower rates of intent to leave and turnover, higher job satisfaction, higher organizational commitment. And these are all things, these are all outcomes that organizations should want um, because ultimately it will lead to a high performance work system that will help the organization to be profitable and successful in a sustainable way. Uh, not just something that will help them be successful this quarter or even this year, but as, especially if they're scaling, they have to be thinking about a year out, five years out, 10 years out, and putting in place the systems, processes, policies, structures, and systems that will help them to manage that growth and to mature as an organization. And that will only happen as you have good people within the organization to help that growth occur. Uh, another way of thinking about this in, in terms of job, uh, person job fit, person organization fit, and, job, and value congruence is the, the mission of the organization. Uh, and this can lead to strong engagement outcomes for employees. So what is the mission statement of the organization? Now, you know, a new, a new startup, they very likely um, aren't necessarily focused right from the get-go about a mission statement, about a value statement, um, because the, they, they're, they're excited about the product or service that they're providing. Now, depending on how they're seeking funding, if they're going, um, trying to get uh, investors or they're trying to go get a business loan, you know, they're gonna have to create that statement as part of their prospectus, um, but, but that's not, in terms of the formal documentation, but that's not always the first thing on their mind. Um, but it's a really important aspect that you wanna be thinking about when you're starting up a new venture. Um, what is the driving purpose of this organization? What value are you gonna add into the world? And that needs to be reflected in your mission statement. And when you have a mission statement, um, a powerful mission statement, that's a reflection on the, and there's, there's a clear reflection of the, the, the internalization of that mission statement within the broader organizational culture, that then drives higher levels of organizational commitment of employees within the organization, and that leads to better um, uh, performance outcomes for the organization, and it leads to higher levels of personal engagement from employees within the organization. So we can't overlook sometimes the cliched elements of like mission statements, value statements, purpose statements. A, a mission statement in and of itself doesn't do anything. So if you, if you just create a nice, nicely worded mission statement or a nicely worded value statement, that's not necessarily gonna do anything for your organization. But when that mission statement is truly embedded into the organization and it, the culture reflects that mission statement, then it does matter and then it will drive higher levels of performance and engagement of employees. Now, really quickly, I wanna share with you a model that I've developed in my own research in terms of um, work quality characteristics, employee engagement, and job satisfaction. Uh, so here you see a, a diagram uh, that shows relationships within the, the, uh, a statistical model. Uh, I'm not gonna bore you with a complex um, uh, statistical model output or anything like that, but you can see the, uh, the inner relationships here and the feedback loops here and how they influence everything. And when we think about employee engagement, we think about job satisfaction, we think about designing uh, meaningful, effective jobs, these are all the types of variables that lots of research has demonstrated are really important, including a lot of my own research. Uh, and I've done a lot of comparative international research where I've looked at how this model plays out across the globe, across dozens of countries, and seeing the similarities and differences in those countries about which of these factors are more important in particular sectors and particular types of organizations of uh, different levels of jobs and so forth. Um, because there's what I, what I hope will come across here is that there's not an easy fix. There's not a one size fits all to employee engagement and job satisfaction. Um, and as you see in the, the uh, 
uh, quote at the bottom, context matters. A meaning is derived from context. Observations are embedded and must be understood within context. So a, a national context, a, a local context, an organizational context, a job context, all of these things matter in terms of how you're going to design uh, em engaging, satisfying work for your employees. And we can't overlook that part, that we have to tailor and specialize our approach. Um, but here you can see general um, individual control variables uh, in terms of individual and family circumstances, organizational um, characteristics and job characteristics, all sorts of things that are important to consider, uh, different ways of slicing the data and different ways of understanding different types of employees. And in terms of general buckets of variables that are really important, we have work-life balance types of variables, we have intrinsic rewards, we have extrinsic rewards, and we have uh, work relations types of variables. Uh, and there's interrelations between all of these, and, and then they influence job satisfaction and employee engagement. Um, so when we have a better sense of what our organization mission is, what our values are, and the type of people that we want in the organization, so there's a high level of person organization fit, we can then start to do the hard work of designing uh, engagement uh, evaluation systems so that we can see where our employees are at in relation to these types of variables and others um, so that we can ensure a really meaningful and powerful organizational experience for them uh, where they feel valued, they feel supported, and they, they can continue to help the organization to succeed. All right, now, other things to consider in terms of measuring employee engagement. Again, I want to hit home this point that there's, there's not a one-size-fits-all. Okay, uh, I'm going to share with you some, some basic approaches um, as a starting point, but you need to understand that every organization is different. And even similar types of organizations within the same industry or sector are still different. Um, their founders are different. Their culture is going to be different. The types of employees they attract are going to be different. And so we, just, we can't just use a one-size-fits-all. So these are general thoughts and principles that can be a starting point for additional discussion, dialogue, uh, exploration within your individual organizational context or your individual unit that you can then um, flesh out to create an engagement strategy uh, for your organization. It starts with determining engagement outcomes uh, for your organization. Um, you know, I have a certain way of defining employee engagement uh, other, another firm might have a different way of defining employee engagement. And, and within the academic literature, there's kind of a general consensus about what that means, but within organizations that might be a little bit different and what matters to them might be a little bit different. So you, if you want to measure something, it always starts with first clearly determining what, the, what those outcomes are that you want, right? And if you don't have clear alignment between the, the outcomes that you're gonna try to achieve and the metrics you're using to measure, then you're never gonna to get to where you wanna be. So uh, first it starts with determining engagement outcomes. And then you need to start going through the process, and this is hard work, uh, but you need to convene groups of employees so that you can, through focus groups, through, through interviews, through uh, different means, so that you can get employee input into the process and you can create employee buy-in into the process. If your engagement strategy and the, your, your approach to measuring engagement within your organization is just a top-down, the, the C-suite says, we, we're going to use this survey, um, now everyone go do it, and managers, make sure your employees do this. If that's the approach, uh, it's not going to be particularly meaningful or helpful for your organization. Uh, so you need to make sure that you're creating employee buy-in. But I, I will fully, fully uh, recognize that that takes more time, that takes more resources, that takes more energy and commitment to do it that way, um, but it will lead to better outcomes. You need to identify what's really truly important to your employees. What are the salient motivators of your employees? And just because something, you know, if you're, if you're a CEO or you're in the C-suite, just because something's valuable to you at your particular stage in life doesn't mean it's that same thing's gonna be valuable to the other people working with you as part of your team. 
So you need to talk to them. You need to understand what they really truly value. And if you're going to try to seek um, ways of leveraging their capacity and, and help increase their motivation and engagement levels, it, if there's a misalignment between what you're offering and what they want, then you're not going to have the desired outcomes, uh, plain and simple. And organizations miss this point all the time. It is so common for organizations to not be clear on the outcomes, to not have um, mechanisms in place that employees actually value. And so then it just becomes a, a, an exercise of collecting data that's not actually particularly meaningful or helpful to helping things improve within the organization. You can also perform a driver's analysis, similar to you know, figuring out what's important to employees, figure out what, and, and this can happen through data analytics and, and uh, statistical analyses, but what actual drivers are the most important? Um, so sometimes employees say something's really important to them, but when you actually do the analysis, you realize, oh, that doesn't actually play out in the data. Um, it doesn't, it's not actually as important as they say it is in, ter in terms of how it influences their motivation and, and performance. So doing a driver's analysis is also going to be important and not just doing that one time, but do, doing that on a regular basis, um, you know, every year, you know, revisiting um, the, the core drivers. Um, use pulse surveys and single click polls, not exclusively. That's not going to be your only way of trying to get this, the to get the pulse of your uh, people and to understand what they want and need. But that can be one mechanism to, to get some of that data. Uh, develop a continuous listening strategy. Uh, something as simple as, and it sounds cliche, but something as simple as an open door policy um, can be really powerful. Or have, if you have shared workspace where you're actually interacting with each other on a regular basis, making sure that you're approachable so that people can come to you and talk to you um, and share with you. Making sure that employees know that you want to listen to them, that their input matters is really, really important. And if you create that kind of an environment, then not only will that in and of itself will lead to higher engagement, um, but it will also help you better understand what they need and want in terms of support, in terms of um, in terms of the various motivating factors so that they, they will perform at a higher level. We often talk about exit interviews, um, which are important. If someone's leaving, we should want to know why, especially if, you know, if they're leaving for you know, what they see as a better opportunity somewhere else, we need to understand why that's happening. Um, but we don't want to just do that when people are leaving. If we're losing our best employee because they see greener pastures somewhere else, you know, we, we can learn from that but we don't want them to leave in the first place. So a stay interview is also very powerful and you can have regular stay interviews with your employees, particularly your best employees. Like what is it, what, what do they value about being part of the organization? What will it take for them to stay with the organization? Have that discussion on a regular basis with, with all of your people, but particularly your best people. Um, turn to employee recognition activities. You want to make sure that all employees um, know that what they're doing uh, is valued by the organization, and you want to make sure that they're acknowledged for that work. Uh, and so there's lots of ways to do this, but think about how to do recognition activities. Uh, measure things like retention rate by, by division, by department. Um, you want to not just know a, a generic retention rate for the overall organization, but you want to be able to, to see specifics under individual leaders even, um, so you can understand if there's a leadership problem, for example. And, and track productivity metrics. Again, if you, if you start with outcomes uh, and you know what you want to achieve, that will inform your metrics that you're going to measure over time, um, the types of productivity. Some types of productivity metrics may not actually be all that relevant to the type of engagement you're trying to drive and the types of, pro the types of um, outcomes that you're trying to drive. So just make sure that you're thinking uh, about those metrics always. Uh, when I think about metrics, for example, I think about the movie Moneyball. Um, you may or may not be familiar with that, um, that movie or that book, uh, but I would encourage you to look into that and read, to watch the movie. It's a great movie. Read the book, it's a great book. Um, the whole point of that is looking at, a, it's a true story, looking at a Major League Baseball team as they're trying to better have better alignment between the types of things they're measuring, 
how they're putting together their team and the performance of the team. And ultimately they come up with new and innovative ways to do that, that allow for better alignment and fit that ultimately help them to be very successful, even when they don't have a lot of money to put into getting the best players. Uh, and not that I want to advocate for not paying people, you know, for what they're worth uh, and the value they bring to the organization, but we all, you know, we have, we have limitations with our resources. And so we also need to be very uh, thoughtful about, the metrics we're using and making sure that the right metrics. We also need to be thinking about organizational culture and engagement. So not just um, not just individual engagement, that's super important, but what about that, um, the engagement across the organization, across groups and teams, and the individuals within those teams, institutional relationships that are important, and looking at the vertical and horizontal relationships within an organization. Uh, we know that a lot of people leave jobs because of their manager, for example. So everything else about the organization could be great. It could, there could be great alignment between um, the values of the employee and the organization, a really powerful, engaging mission, uh, great purpose. Uh, everything else about the job could be wonderful, the types of work they're doing, and if, if the relationships with, with their team and with their manager are poor, uh, people will still leave, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to make sure that we're monitoring those relationships and have mechanisms in place for that. So one simple tool that everyone could start using right away uh, was developed by the Gallup, um, by Gallup. Uh, it's called the Q12 Index, and many of you may already be familiar with this. It's a very simple, it's 12 questions, which means you can easily build this into interviews or create a very simple survey that you send out to employees asking these questions. Now you can formally go through Gallup to be a part of this. Um, and if you go through Gallup, then the data that's collected from your organization goes into their big pool of data for, for they have hundreds of thousands of data points across organizations across the globe. And then you can get um, analyses that look at how your organization stacks up to organiza other organizations and such. So that can be powerful comparative data that you can utilize. But whether or not you formally go through Gallup to do that, uh, you can st still use these questions within your own organization to measure really key areas of engagement. Do you know what's expected of you at work? I mean, expectations are so important, right? Do you know what your manager wants to be done? Uh, is that clearly communicated to you? And do you know what, how to fulfill that, right? If, you, if that's not the case, there's going to be a clear mismatch in terms of your effort and what you're accomplishing, um, so that's important. Um, do you have the materials and equipment to do your work right? At work, do you have the opportunity to do what you do best every day, or are you stuck doing other menial types of jobs that you don't that you know don't really leverage your capacity uh, or what you bring to the table, so on and so forth. So you, you can see all these questions. You could very simply with even just I mean you, you could you could use a, a Google form. Uh, you don't need any special software. You could use a Google form, put these questions into it, send it out to your team, get their input, aggregate the data, and track it over time. And that would be a powerful mechanism for you to have a general sense of engagement within your organization. And it wouldn't cost you any money, uh, and you could do it immediately. Uh, every organization could do this tomorrow, and it would be super simple, right? And it would start to yield some benefits in terms of uh, insights to your organization, whether you have five people on your team, 10, 50, 100, 1,000, okay? So that's that's one approach um, that uh, would be super simple. Now I wanna share with you an example of an experience I had as a consultant with an organization that was going through rapid scale up um, because of confidentiality in terms of the, the, the consultant client relationship. I'm not going to specify the organization, but I, I can talk in general terms about um, what they were facing and the types of issues that they were facing and those sorts of things. Um, this wasn't a new startup. Uh, this was a local family-run business that had been around for several generations. Um, so this, this, this company had fine-tuned their approach, their, their product, and the services they provided. They knew what they were doing. They were doing it well. And because they were doing it well, they were approached by investors. And when the investors um, uh, came into the picture, they had this huge influx of money, uh, they had new people involved in the decision-making of the organization, and very rapidly, 
uh, over the course of about five years. They expanded from about 100 employees uh, to well over 2,000 employees, not just locally um, within one, pretty much within one metropolitan area, but certainly within the state, but then going nationally and having hundreds of locations uh, nationally within just about five years. That is a really difficult challenge for any organization to face. Um, and I would argue it's perhaps even more challenging for a family-run business that's scaling up rapidly than even a new entrepreneurial endeavor, a new startup that's scaling rapidly um, because they, they had a lot of baggage, right? They, they, they had generations worth of, of knowledge built up um, within this, this organization, within this family running this organization, and now they had new investors, they had new people, you know, uh, voicing their opinions about uh, how to do their business and how to do it uh, effectively, cost efficiently, how to scale it, all those types of things. So that transition, uh, I think, was particularly hard for, it, I think that kind of a transition is particularly difficult for any family-run business, but I think it it definitely was a challenge for this organization that I worked with um, going through that transition and bringing in people that aren't part of the family in, in key leadership positions and decision-making positions. Any organization scaling up that rapidly is going to struggle with just the maturing nature of the organization, the increasing complexity of the organization. And that was certainly the case here. They went, this particular uh, firm that I was working with, they went from a very basic management structure and hierarchy um, with really just a couple levels and, and everyone knew everybody and the, all the leaders were family members. They went from that situation to now they had a much more hierarchical structure. They had many, many layers. They were dispersed not just across a metropolitan area in a, one state within the US, but now across the whole country um, and they were having to deal with just all the policy issues related to that, all the legal issues related to that, all the leadership issues related to that, and it was really challenging, which leads to the next point of developing organizational leaders. Traditionally, with family members doing running all of the leadership roles within the organization, that simply wasn't possible anymore. Um, and those, those family members didn't necessarily have the abilities, the competencies and, and the capabilities to be able to run such a large organization. So, you know, they, they were good at doing what they were doing as a family run business, smaller scale, but now the complexity was just so, so much more that they, they, those family members didn't know how to do it. And so new professionalized administration was brought in, new people were brought in, and they were also trying to raise up people within the organization to take on leadership roles. That whole process was incredibly difficult uh, for this organization. They were also trying to maintain the core of their organizational culture. So what they'd experienced for generations as a family-run business now was getting, you know, and being dispersed nationally and bringing all these new people any organization would have to work really hard in that situation to try to, um, to maintain and have a sustainable, um, positive culture. And frankly, this organization wasn't accomplishing it. Uh, they, there, there wasn't consistency. Uh, there, wa there wasn't consistency in terms of communication. There wasn't cons consistency in terms of how policies were interpreted and implemented. There wasn't consistency in all the institutional mechanisms that help to reinforce the culture. Uh, so they were dealing with all the problems related to that. Because of this, they had a couple, what I would say were two major challenges that I was brought in to help them face. Uh, one was just a huge level of employee turnover. Now the industry with uh, that they were in uh, relatively, I mean, it's all relative, right? Uh, we, we always have to think about industry norms uh, in terms of what normal turnover is. Um, but this industry tended to have a little bit higher turnover than, you know, some other industries. So that in and of itself wasn't uh, a problem that they had high turnover, but the massive amount of employee turnover that they had, which, which outstripped industry no norms, uh, they had about 10 times 
the industry norms for turnover. They had an incredible amount of turnover uh, within this organization, in part driven by problems with the culture, problems with the organization, problems with the leadership. Um, so people were coming in and they were leaving. Um, and they went through, uh, the, they went through uh, this, just this revolving door of employees uh, over the course of a year. And at one point we calculated, even for the lowest level employee within this organization, which the, the, for the lowest level entry level employee, um, really they just needed a high school education um, with not a lot of extra you know, skill or specialty. And so even for that type of person coming into the organization, we calculated that it cost them about 5,000 US dollars uh, for each of those people. So you, and you start to multiply that 5,000 times just for this lower level type of employee, um, they estimated, uh, well, we actually we calculated that they went through about 2,500 um, hires every year just for that lower level type of position. That is insane levels of turnover. And $5,000 a pop for each of those people, we're talking millions of dollars. Um, that that's costing the organization in the constant revolving door. And we're not even talking about uh, higher levels of positions. And there was turnover in those higher level positions as well. Uh, and, and that's more expensive, right, when you get into higher level positions. Um, so how do we address this turnover problem? Uh, that was one of the key questions. And addressing and confronting the internal leadership and politics, because you had this tight-knit family that had been running the organization for a long time, and now you have new people coming in. There was a lot of butting of heads uh, and a lot of, uh, you know, people saying one thing in a leadership meeting and then going behind people's back, backstabbing, um, uh, a lot of passive-aggressive behaviors where people would say one thing to your face and then do something different when you weren't around. All those types of things were happening, and I experienced many of those things firsthand. Um, as I'm trying to, to understand the complexities of the challenges of the organization and talk to different leaders, getting different stories from different people, um, helping them develop measurement tools to understand their engagement and satisfaction that was influencing the turnover issues that they were facing. That was incredibly challenging because I was getting different information and diff being told different stories based on who I was talking to, and there wasn't consistency in the leadership team. And there wasn't a consistent buy-in from the leadership team and even having me there as a consultant to try to address these issues. Some people were grateful that I was there trying to help because I was bringing you know, an expertise to the table that they didn't have. Other people you know, were very skeptical and very um, felt very defensive and felt like I was dangerous because I was there, because they felt like that would put their jobs in danger. So all these dynamics were at play uh, as I was trying to work with them and to help them. Now, I, I worked with them for about a year and a half. And during that time, we, we put together some really good measurement tools. We implemented them um, consistently and holistically across the organization. And we started to see some good outcomes. We were getting really positive feedback, especially from um, supervisors and kind of middle management level people within the hierarchy, they were really loving what the types of insights they were getting and the types of analytics we were providing them. They were, we were helping them make better hiring decisions. We were helping them retain their people. Uh, there was a lot of good positive movement. Unfortunately, I didn't see the same type of excitement at the executive level in the C-suite because many of them felt defensive and they felt um, they, they felt that they were being put in harm's way because of the approaches we were taking. Uh, and it ultimately culminated in there's, there were still continued problems in terms of the finances. Um, there's expenses were out of control and we, we just weren't getting the, the, um, the traction we needed with even the improvements we were having to help them stave off some of the financial troubles they, they were having. Uh, and so literally, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question there. Yes, So uh, if you have to sort of narrow down the top two challenges or uh, if they had to revisit this growth phase, right? 
doing what could have sort of uh, helped them prepare the organization for them to bring in all these people? Is it more about uh, being clear on what their approach of first principles about uh, mm -hmm. what is okay and what is not okay? In, in other words, this is what we call as culture. Or is it, so in, in different ways, uh, there are three layers which in my personal experience where I've, I've felt that can be challenges. One is operational, second is strategic, where you and I don't have alignment on what the company should be doing. The top most comes to be like people, right? So people in terms of, uh, hey, do I basically trust you on this decision? Uh, can we work together? Uh, so where do you think in this case the challenge was? Was it on the people layer? Was it on the alignment on strategy? Or was it more on operational way of working things? Really, uh, that, that's a great question and comment. Um, all three layers had problems um, for sure. But I think the biggest challenges came from the leadership. So the, there was great positive movement on the lower levels of the hierarchy uh, in terms right. of managers and supervisors. But the, the C-suite, the executive leadership, um, there was so much inconsistency in terms of communication, so much inconsistency in terms of, of mission, values, culture, um, Got it. That, that people didn't, <laughs> they, they, people were nervous constantly. Uh, right. and, and lower level managers were always worried about their jobs, um, because they were getting conflicting information. Got um, so I, I think to, to your first part of your question, what could they have done? What should they have done earlier? Um, basically, they shouldn't have waited until they had 2,000 employees you know, or more to bring someone like me in to help them. Got it. <laughs> um, whether, whether they needed to bring someone in, external, you know, an external person in or not, they needed someone, they, they could have hired someone with that expertise to do it internally, and that would have been fine too. But, but they didn't address it early on. So what I would say to any organization from, even if you have five employees, you should be looking at engagement and satisfaction metrics, and you should be measuring it, and you should be addressing those issues. Got Certainly it. as you grow, if you get up to 20, 50, 100 employees, you absolutely should be doing that. And when you get to the point where you have hundreds and thousands of employees, if you're not doing that, um, I can almost guarantee you're going to have major problems. Uh, just just so the fact it? that they just the fact that they weren't doing that was a major um, was a major indicator of all the problems that they were facing. <laughs> Got it. Got Go it. ahead. Yeah. Was it more uh, enge engagement? Uh, measuring engagement is something which. Uh, is more of a lagging indicator, right? So in terms of a leading indicator, right? Uh, what do you think will be more foundational uh, in in doing something which are, which results in, like, say, better engagement? Is it the aspect of uh, as a uh, as as people call out like, like clarity of where we are going as a company and alignment on that, or is it more of psychological safety that hey? Uh, Yes, there are a lot of things that is ambiguous uh, in terms of the goal of where we are going because we are going behind certain opportunities which are not 100% figured out, etc. But, mm -hmm. uh, but hey, you know what? Uh, that doesn't mean you're going to be affected by this, right? So that's the psychological yeah. safety zone. Which yeah. so in each of these cases, the company could have taken either one of these stances, right? So uh, if I have to. Uh, uh, sort of go back to the company or if I'm the founder of the company, what do you think uh, I should have done more as a leading, uh, uh, something which impacts the leading indicator while I understand that, yes, I measure the engagement, I get to know that something is wrong, but how can I be in a place where uh, I know that I'm working in a direction where the engagement is going to be good? Yeah, uh, great, great question. I mean, ultimately, we won't know until we measure, right, until we do the analyses. Um, but there are basic principles that are pretty much universal in terms of um, 
communicating expectations in terms of creating, like you referred to psychological safety, right? People want, people aren't going to be committed to an organization if they feel unsafe and they're not going to be creative and innovative if they feel like they're going to be punished for any little mistake they make, right? So they have to feel safe to try things. They have to feel safe to share their opinion. They have to feel safe. Um, they have to feel that they trust their leaders because their leaders are proactively communicating with them, right? And so as organizations keep those basic principles and concepts in mind as they're going through those early scaling processes and simultaneously putting in, you know, again, thinking of outcomes, uh, identifying key metrics, pr productivity and performance metrics, uh, and then putting those things in place so they can start measuring them, then they, they can be proactive about looking at uh, trends over time and understanding how things are shifting. Um, at my university, for example, now we're, we're not a start, you know, we're not going through scale up, we're not a startup, you know, it's a different context, right? But at our university, for example, we're part of what's called um, the best colleges to work for um, survey. This is a, a U.S. national survey that so many universities participate in, similar to like what I described with the Gallup, wh where organizations can participate, they, they contribute their data to it, then they get reports back and they can see how they compare and they can track things over time. That's the same type of what we're doing at the university. Um, and we do it every year and we get our data back. Um, and so, you know, some, empl some employees at the university, some faculty, some staff are super skeptical about it because they don't see any change over time. They see problems that persist from year to year to year. And in some cases they dip, in some cases they go up a little bit. Um, but one of the questions that's included in that survey is do the employees trust that the management team will utilize the feedback from the survey data to make positive changes for the organization? And that one indicator, you know, I, I don't mean to call out my university, but that indicator at my university is not very strong, uh, meaning the common employee, the average employee doesn't really trust that leadership is going to do anything with the data. They're not going to do anything with the information. Um, now, I don't actually, personally, I don't think that's true. Personally, I think our leadership team does care about the data and that they are trying to make positive improvements. But if the average employee doesn't believe that, if they don't trust that, then it, you're not going to have good outcomes. Got right? It. So that's that sort of uh, indicator which you get, which you sort of identify and then go back and at least start investing. Maybe it could be like a communication aspect, right? You're doing yeah. something, but people are still not feeling so, but so maybe you should be over communicating. That could also be the intervention is your point. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in transparency and I'm a big believer in communication. And if you're gonna err, in terms of your communication strategy, if you're gonna err, err on the side of over communication um, because when, when there's not enough information or people perceive that there's not enough information, regardless of what the reality is, if people perceive it, um, they perceive a vacuum of information, they will start to fill the vacuum. They'll start to fill the void. They'll start to gossip. They'll start to share their own um, conspiracy theories. They're going to start, <laughs> they're going to fill in the gaps um, that they feel are there. And usually it's not going to be in a positive way. Uh, usually it's going to only hurt the organization. So communicate, over-communicate, be transparent, uh, engender and foster trust. These are all just really core elements that any organization is going to face, but particularly a, a, a rapidly scaling organization. Uh, there's just so much uncertainty. There's so much um, um, concern that people have about, uh, about the situation, and there's so much constant change that's occurring in that environment, that you have to take really proactive measures to, to develop that trust and to maintain it over Got time. It. Yeah, I think great, okay. great question. So, talking about uh, you know, the example that you know, you're working with the company, so it seemed like the leaders were in denial uh, of you know, uh, developing a culture, maintaining it, and uh, you know, uh, bringing in employment, engagement, and satisfaction measures. Uh, so is that a problem that you know you encounter uh, or you have encountered while working with various uh, companies or is ignorance a problem or or 
uh, they just don't care? Great question, and I would say yes, all of the above. Um, <laughs> honestly, it depends on the organization. It depends on the leader. Um, but it's one of the things that you know when I when I'm I, I teach consulting, for example, at my university. So when I'm teaching students how to do consulting engagements, one of the things we talk a lot about is creating leader buy-in, um, breaking down um, resistance and defense mechanisms, because some leaders, you know. If someone brings you in, they hire you to come in, they obviously believe in you, right? They hired you. Um, but that doesn't mean that other people in the leadership team feel the same way. And there will be resistance. Um, and so you have to work with, the, with um, the team to help reduce that resistance. I've experienced some level of resistance with pretty much every organization I've ever worked with. Uh, and so you just have to, to understand that that will be there. But as you communicate with them, as you... Um, as you work collectively with them, jointly with them, to create your approach, to understand the timetable, the deliverables, the types of things you're going to be working on, you can help to break down that resistance. Now, at the particular organization I was describing, absolutely, um, there was resistance. Uh, there, there was ignorance. Um, there were people who felt like they knew what to do, but clearly didn't. Um, so that's a problem. So some, some kind of intellectual hubris involved sometimes with leaders who don't want to be told um, what a more effective approach might be even when what they're doing there's clear track record of failure I mean there, there's ego involved so that you have to deal with that delicately I mean there's lots of things that you have to really consider um, and I don't, I don't claim to have the answer to all of those you know I, I'm not going to get it right all the time when I'm working with organizations um, and no matter what I do, it seems, no matter how much I experience, it, it never ceases to amaze me how new things will come up that I've never experienced before. So uh, it, ju it just also draws, um, it, it comes back to my point earlier that you, a one-size-fits-all fit, approach just doesn't work, right? You, just, you have to take every new situation afresh. You have to, there, there are certain commonalities, there are certain um, principles that apply in most situations but you have to go in intellectually curious every single time you go in to face this challenge within an organization um, because there's going to be unique challenges, there's going to be unique resistance, there's going to be unique um, issues that have to be faced. Right. So it seems like a scene of chaos uh, at this particular company that you're talking about. So what were the, like, the top three or five key steps that you took to ensure, uh, you know, to bring in uh, some sort of semblance uh, Yeah, well, one of the reasons why I'm sharing this particular example is because we never got past the chaos. Um, and, and I see that in large part my failure, you know, as I was dealing with the leadership team. Um, and so what the, the final outcome that I, I hadn't shared yet was one day I, I wake up, you know, I'm, I'm thinking it, it's a Monday, right? So we just had the weekend. Uh, I'm thinking, okay, what, what are, what are we going to do this week with this organization? How am I going to help them? And I wake up, uh, I, I look at my email, and I see uh, an email from the chief HR officer at the organization, who, by the way, fully believed in what we were doing, right? He, he was fully bought in. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he told me, he alerted to me, alerted me to the fact that the company had just filed for bankruptcy, um, that they just laid off most of their employees, and all this had happened in an emergency decision-making session of the board over the weekend. And so people were showing up to work Monday morning with the doors closed with a sign up saying, you know, you don't have a job, right? That's the environment. So chaos led to complete failure uh, in this situation. Um, they went through Title IX bankruptcy. It, you know, it was just one of those situations where everything about it fell apart, uh, which was incredibly unfortunate. And I think in part, that was because they were, frankly, trying to address super deep problems too late in the game. Part of it was because uh, even while I'd been working with them for a year and a half, there still hadn't coalesced a common commitment amongst the leadership team into what we were trying to do. So there's still infighting, backstabbing, and internal politicking happening. That was a problem, right? And ultimately, we just didn't get the traction 
for what everything we were trying to do. There were key leaders that were bought in, and then there was a lot of buy-in down the line, but there were too many um, key stakeholders at, at the senior level who were secretly undermining things that ultimately it wasn't successful. Um, so that unfortunately was the outcome. I wish I could say it differently. I wish I could say it was complete chaos and we took these five steps and in you know another two years we cleaned things up and everything was better, but it wasn't. Um, and it's, it's a cautionary tale uh, for organizations. There, there was a local um, company uh, here in Utah. We, we have what's called Silicon Slopes. Um, so you know everyone's heard of Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. Well, we, Utah, uh, along the Wasatch Fund, is also a tech hub and for entrepreneurial tech startups. Um, and so we have what's called Silicon Slopes. And there was a, a local um, tech firm startup that had gone through rapid scaling. Um, and seemingly everything was fine. And then all of a sudden they announced mass layoffs. Um, just kind of out of the blue. Like nobody in the industry saw it coming. Nobody, you know, anyone outside of the executive levels at the organization didn't see it coming and they just had they laid off like half of their workforce um or like almost overnight um and so when those types of things happen um you know they're cautionary tales and and what every organization needs to be thinking about are what are the mechanisms what how are you creating a sustainable organization what are the mechanisms you're putting in place to help the organization be successful? How are you communicating with your employees? How are you investing in them? How are you, how are you measuring things like motivation, engagement, productivity, satisfaction, um, but more than just the measurement, how are you utilizing the data from that measurement to reinvest, to reinvest in your employees and how are you communica communicating back to them, right? And I think that's what has to happen in any organization really, but particularly in rapidly scaling up organizations um, otherwise, there's just so many pitfalls uh, along that process of growth um, that I think it's going to be it's going to be the rule, not the exception, that you're going to see failure um, when when you have uh, just just the inherent problems with that kind of rapid scale up. So, um, some other questions uh, that I thought I would just really quickly address as we're running short on time. Uh, how can scaling up uh, a company to measure engagement and satisfaction, how, how can you go about doing that? And really, it can start super simple. Uh, you don't even have to do a formal survey. It could be informal discussions and conversations. Um, and if you do do a survey, use, use existing technology that you have that's free. You know, Google Sheets is fine. You could use SurveyMonkey, right? <laughs> like there's lots of ways to do it. It's not complicated. But what the more important thing is that you do something, that you start early and that you be consistent. And then over time, you can start to build your capacity and the complexity um, of what you're doing uh, so that you can have even deeper insights. Uh, I think that's just really important. Start simple, be consistent, develop it over time. Um, what can HR leaders do uh, in terms of thinking about employee engagement, uh, and satisfaction, uh, what can they do to, to create comprehensive systems within their organization? Again, from the beginning, everyone needs to be bought in that this is an important thing that they need to be doing. Um, and again, if, if, you're, if, you're, if it's a new tech startup and you have uh, founders who are really more on the, the technology side, they're good coders or whatever, they may not know or care about this stuff which is why you need someone on the team early who does understand the importance of this, get the buy-in, create the feedback loops, get, start collecting the data, and, and start to have the discussions and the conversations about how you're gonna invest and reinvest in your employees to keep them engaged and motivated so they can be productive. Uh, how often should you measure? I would say at a minimum, you do it yearly, right? If you have some sort of a systematic approach, um, at least yearly to track trends over time across divisions, uh, across domains, across direct reporting lines, those sorts of things. But I'm also a huge believer in more continual um, feedback loops. And so you, you, it, you, if, it's, if it's a big long survey that you're trying to do or big long interviews that you're trying to do, it's not feasible to do it 
you know, constantly. You can't do it monthly. You can't do it quarterly even. It's just too much time and energy. Um, but if it's a fairly simple approach that you're taking, then yeah, collect frequent data. Um, give regular, consistent feedback and frequent feedback to people. And, that, and, and employees will value that. And especially if they see how you're utilizing the, the data that's being collected to make good, positive improvements. And if you're communicating those improvements back to the employees. Uh, another couple, uh, another few questions. Uh, what should you do if you find that your measures are not actually giving you the desired results? This is the, the assessment challenge that every organization faces. Uh, I, I honestly don't know of an organization that isn't trying to do better at this. Um, and what it comes down to is you, you always have to be thinking about what your outcomes are that you, that you want and what are the metrics that you're measuring um, to, to know if you're getting to those outcomes and is there clear alignment. And when there's not clear alignment, you have to tweak and you have to um, shift over time. And that means you have to be looking at the data on a regular basis. There's, there's no substitute for consistency here. Um, you need to be doing basic analyses to measure the validity of what your, uh, of your metrics and the desired outcomes. And, and as I mentioned just a moment ago, you also have to be thinking about the utility of what you're doing. Um, because, you know, I wear a couple hats. Like on, one, on the one hand, I do consulting work, right? And everyone's worried about time and cost. On the other hand, I am a professor and I do academic research. And so when I'm doing something in terms of academic research, I have to, I necessarily have a different lens in terms of utility because there's a certain rigor that is necessary in order for me to do research that I can then publish in academic journals. But when I'm with an organization, working with an organization, they don't necessarily care about that same level of scientific rigor they want something that will give them good outcomes. Um, and so the utility equation is different. And I, and I usually, I'm not gonna be successful in getting an organization to commit the time and resources to do the type of analyses that I would want to do to publish in a peer reviewed academic journal, if that makes sense. So just always be thinking about the, the utility uh, equation uh, what what's the cost involved with what you're trying to do with your measurement uh, versus the benefit and the outcome mm -hmm. for the organization? Uh, do your do your approaches to measuring employee engagement and satisfaction do they depend on different context? And the short answer is absolutely it does. Uh, I, I referred to this earlier in the model that I shared: um, size of company and headcount, geographical um, location. Uh, things like expansion, funding stage, um, economic conditions, geopolitical, socioeconomic. I mean, there's so many different um, contextual factors that lead into, you know, what your analysis is going to show and, and how it's going to impact your organization. So absolutely, you need to be thinking about benchmarking with, with your industry, benchmarking with your geography, when possible and you're doing, if you have someone in the organization that has the, the, um, the quantitative competencies to do the data analytics and the statistical analyses, you certainly should try to build in those types of context variables into your assessment models that you're gonna be building over time. But that, that starts to get into a lot of complexity and, and I will acknowledge that most organizations don't have the expertise to deal with that kind of complexity in their modeling. Um, and so if that's the case for you, you know, if, if, if you are a smaller organization or you don't have the capacity or you don't have the time for someone to devote to that kind of level of rigor uh, in your analysis, that's okay. Uh, you can still start simple, expand your capacity over time, uh, and to the extent possible, even if it's just a matter of basic descriptive dis statistics benchmarking across industries, across geographies, across divisions, that will still be very helpful. And it'll help you, you can still start to identify some, uh, some uh, patterns in what you're seeing. Uh, and so I would absolutely recommend that every organization try to do that to the extent possible. Um, the, another question, would the fundamentals be any different uh, for a 100 member company versus a 500 member company or a thousand or 10,000, right? Um, the answer is, of course, again, context matters, so size matters, 
and how you're going to be going about doing it. And, and I should add that that, that influences your um, utility equation, right? Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to collect data in, you know, with 100 people uh, in terms of opportunity costs, in terms of time involved in, in collecting the data, running the analyses and everything. Um, it's one thing for 100 people versus 500 or 1,000. Uh, so the utility equation shifts over time, but also the complexity of the HRS, HRIS system that you need to use. And while I might use a Google form to collect data when I have 20 people on the team, you know, when I have 100 or 1,000 people, I'm not going to be using a Google form anymore, right? So now I need to have more um, robust um, technologies that I'm using to facilitate the data collection and analysis and the feeding back of the data. Um, but I do think the fundamentals tend to be the same in terms of the key questions that I outlined earlier and kind of the steps to measuring engagement, the types of questions that you need to be asking um, uh, and thinking about the metrics and the outcomes. All those fundamentals are the same, but the complexity of the system that you're going to put in process, the, the, the complexity of the system that you're going to put in place and the processes that support it, um, those will get more complex as you saw as you scale up and as you have larger organizations. I think that's absolutely true. Okay. Uh, any any other types of follow-up questions to these that you have? I, I have one question. Uh, so, uh, you know, typically the founders of companies, I mean, you can call it call them as the first HR leader of their own organization, right? Uh, so, uh, and you also mentioned at the beginning of the presentation of the presentation that uh, a manager and uh, you know any supervisor at any level, they they also perform uh, HR functions. But I'm assuming uh, you know most organizations do not think of it this way. Uh, uh, so my question is, how can startup founders and can prep themselves to do these HR functions? And how can HR work at these levels uh, to ensure that you know uh, they have uh, employment uh, engagement and satisfaction measures, uh, you know, going and working well for the company? Uh, great, great questions. Um, it's it's tough if if you don't have founders that understand the necessity of this that hopefully someone will join the team early enough that does recognize it, even if they don't have the expertise, they recognize the importance, that then they can advocate for investing in it, whether it's bringing in a consultant, hiring another person that has a specialty, whatever. Um, so, I mean, getting that buy-in early is important, and it's hard when you don't have it represented in the founders. Um, and there's no easy answer to that. Uh, if they, When people don't know what they don't know, then they're not going to invest in learning about something that they didn't even know was a gap, right? So that, that's, that's part of the problem. Um, but if people do know it's important, but they know and they also know that they don't have the expertise, they don't necessarily need to hire a consultant or bring in a full-time person to do that work. Um, there are ways they can train themselves, and there's increasingly more avenues to do that. I mean, things like LinkedIn Learning, has so many great resources. Um, there's, I mean, there's so many professional um, uh, resources on YouTube, Khan Academy, free resources that are available all over the place. Webinars like this, right, that companies put out. There's so many opportunities for people to get an understanding of um, of what's important, you know, to run the various aspects of, aspects of the organization to upskill. Uh, in you know in, in terms of the people elements of the organization and having an employee centric organization so if if a leader recognizes there's a gap there's lots of avenues um, there you know I'm thinking of like uh, the Society for Human Resource Management if, if you don't have a large enough organization to justify having an HR function having an HR person you know doing that function there are so many resources with um, with organizations like the Society for Human Resource Management, or the the HR Certification Institute, or um, 
World at Work, or I mean, there's so many organizations that provide content, that provide resources, that provide templates, um, that provide trainings to help leaders um, do this, right? Uh, when they're small businesses or when they're scaling up. Let me just wrap things up then um, with two final main thoughts, okay? Um, when I think about an employee-centric organization, when I think about an organization that truly values its human capital, I think of how we lead our organization. And years ago, uh, I, I created this model. I mean, no, there's nothing about this model that's like uniquely innovative. Um, you can find elements of this in lots of other places, right? But I was just sitting down one day thinking about how do we understand leadership styles? How do we understand how they influence organizations? And I was trying to think of a kind of a generalized way of understanding the, 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 uh, the connections, right? And for me, it comes down to um, intellectual humility. It comes down to an attitude of lifelong learning. And it comes down to uh, leaders recognizing the value of their employees and be, being willing to support and lead them. Uh, by serving them. So I have this as a foundational, a foundational core of my own leadership philosophy is servant leadership and the intersection of leadership with service, um, where, where a founder, a manager, a C-suite executive, that they don't see themselves above the other employees, but they, they recognize the innate value of every employee, um, the unique value they bring to the table, and then they're going to support them and help them and, and, so they can leverage that value uh, to help the organization. And when that's the mentality, it leads to really great things. Um, so what you see here with kind of this understanding of a foundational approach to servant leadership is then if we have intellectual humility as leaders, then we're constantly self-reflecting and we're constantly trying to better understand ourselves, our own motivations, our own drivers. But like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we can't just assume that what we want is what other people want. Or we can't just assume the way we understand things are the ways that other people are going to understand things. And so we also need to proactively try to better understand other people that we lead and serve. We need to break down our personal biases, our both our implicit and explicit biases, our prejudices, and we need to better understand the people we work with. Uh, and when we do that, it's this feedback loop, right? The more I understand about others, the more I understand about myself, the more I understand about myself, the more I understand about others. And that helps me lead better. Um, but there's also gaps in how we, in the skills and abilities, the capabilities and competencies that we have. So we have to proactively seek to fill those gaps by developing those skills and abilities. We can do that through trainings. We can do that through working with coaches and consultants. We can do that through higher education or informal ways of education. But if we seek lifelong learning, then we will continually be able to develop our skills and abilities. But just learning about something isn't enough. We, I can't just take a class. You know, I can't just do a Khan Academy course or do a LinkedIn learning or whatever and then all of a sudden be a better leader. Um, I have to apply it. And it's through the, the process of applying it through my leadership and service of others that then I continually will get that feedback that you see in the outside feedback loops that come back to my self-understanding and my understanding of others. And I, that should be a, a, a never-ending process. Uh, any good leader is going to continually be going through this process and developing themselves. And when you look at the great organizations and you look at the great leaders um, who run those organizations, this is what they do. Um, this is what they're constantly doing. And it, and it comes back to them being committed to the purpose of the organization, being committed to their employees uh, and wanting to help every employee fulfill their human capital capacity to fulfill their personal potential. Um, it's that commitment you know, coupled with intellectual humility that allows organizations to be innovative and continually thrive. Uh, so that's something that I wanted to take some time to mention. That I, and I hope this would be the attitude that any founder would have, that any, um, any organizational leader would have, but particularly while they're scaling up, because they're going to be dealing with new problems and issues and challenges that they've never even thought of before, that they've never even conceived. They, and they don't know what they don't know. And so if they're not proactively trying to continually learn and grow, 
they're going to they're going to miss things. They're going to miss major things. Uh, and ultimately, like in the example I gave, it was chaos and it it fell apart. And eventually, it it, it turned into one of these um, one of these uh, these cautionary tales of, of what can happen when you have people driven by their ego, people not being willing to check themselves and to try to work together. Um, that's ultimately what happened in, in the example I shared uh, and why they weren't successful. Finally, I'll end, uh, this will be the last main point. How do we get out of our functional silos in our work and as we lead others? This also pertains specifically to rapid scaling up, uh, particularly startups. Um, you know, we, you have founders that are a mile deep in their expertise. That's why they, they've come up with some new product or service, some new idea, particularly in the, in the tech industry. You know, for, for them to have some new idea that's going to really be valued in the market, they, they're going to have to have ex, a, a lot of expertise. Uh, but often that expertise is a mile deep and an inch wide. Um, and there's need for that kind of expertise, but there's also need for a breadth of expertise. Um, and so while I'm not, you know, sometimes we think of generalists as kind of like a mile wide and an inch deep, that's not necessarily helpful either. You know, you, you need to have a combination. So maybe what I'm advocating for is rather than a mile deep and inch wide or a mile wide and an inch deep, maybe we need to have teams that are built of people who have a combination of an interdisciplinary um, approach, um, breaking free of functional silos, where they can understand the holistic nature of the business, all the core different functional areas, with enough functional expertise that they can make good decisions. So maybe maybe they're a hundred yards wide and a hundred yards deep, rather than a mile wide and an inch deep or whatever. Right? Does that make sense? Um, the bottom line is, while expertise is important, and you do need certain experts to drive innovation, you also need collaboration. Uh, and when people get stuck in their silos, collaboration isn't happening. And uh, people aren't talking, uh, getting outside of themselves and getting outside of their own expertise and their own understanding. Most new innovations happen not because someone is a genius and comes up with the, the new thing that's going to change the world. It usually happens because you get two smart, intelligent people who have different areas of expertise that talk to each other and see a new connection that nobody previously had seen. It's those new connections that are the innovations. And, and then, then you build out those connections um, to, for the new startup venture, right? Um, so that's more of what we need. And for organizations to scale, they need to work closely together and they need to collaborate well together. Um, so that's what I would advocate for generally, is find a way to break free of our silos, foster a, cult, foster a leadership style of servant leadership, and foster an organizational culture of, um, of knowledge sharing, of, of uh, innovation, and being employee-centric. And I think when organizations can do that, that will lead to more um, long-term sustainable growth within the organization. Um, so I think that was the last major um, point I wanted to make. I, I, again, I welcome questions. You can find out more about me and my uh, business at www.innovativehumancapital.com. You can reach out to me by email. Uh, I'm more than happy to talk with anyone offline. Um, any, any final thoughts or questions from either of you? I think this was uh, fabulous, uh, Jonathan. Thanks uh, for sharing. Uh, some of your real life stories. I think that's where uh, you know the whole thing came to light on uh, uh, on on the experiences that you went through. I think that was very uh, useful uh, for us to uh, even relate to some of these uh, challenges. So I think that was uh, something which I personally enjoyed. Thanks so much uh, for your time. Okay, Thank wonderful. You so much. John, thank I you. think this was one of the most engaging sessions I've been part of, and uh, thank you for uh, that. Okay, awesome. Uh, it's yes. been a pleasure. Thank you, and I look forward to to, um, to hearing back from you in terms of the various materials and content. Thanks so much, John. Okay, thank, thank you. you John. All right.